Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year in advance. Good. It's great to see you. I hope you've had a great Christmas, wherever you've been, whoever you've been with. My name's Matt. My privilege to speak to you this morning. I'm speaking on something which I just felt to, to speak on. It's not from any, any series. I thought this would be a great message, I think, for this morning. Can you turn in a Bible, if you've got one, to Hebrews chapter 10? Hebrews chapter 10. And... Um, let me just turn to it in my Bible, Hebrews chapter 10. I don't know how your Christmas has been. You may have met, met different people, various people this Christmas, and I forget it. in different states of, some of them don't believe. You've probably met some of your friends' family who are not Christians. You may have met some who are superly encouraged, really talking about Christ, passionate about Jesus, like we heard from Susie this morning. Susie exudes passion for Jesus, doesn't she? That wasn't very... Doesn't she? Yes. Yes. I you can, yeah. she ex doesn't she? What's this? Doesn't she? Doesn't she? She does. Yes, exudes passion for Jesus. And you've probably met some people like that as well, I hope. But you may also have met some people who are struggling in their faith and maybe have even given up on their faith. I've met a few people like that over Christmas. People who once were passionate for Jesus and now are no longer walking with him. Don't know what they believe. Not sure they believe God's word anymore. Not sure that they want to, well, they, that they don't want to follow him anymore. And it's sobering. It's... Uh, it reminds us that we're all vulnerable. We're all vulnerable, aren't we, to discouragements. We're all vulnerable to temptations. We're all vulnerable. We live in a world that throws a lot of unbelief at us. Or rather, it's not unbelief. It's a temptation to put your faith in other things. Because however you live is by faith, friends. If you don't believe in God, that's a faith statement. So no, it's not. This is just facts. No, it's not. It's a faith statement. You are currently sitting on a globe, floating over a, over a vacuum, held in space, that's going 4,000 or so miles an hour around the sun, rotating at over 400 miles an hour or something like that. These are all just made up from my head, so I'm, I could be completely wrong. <laughs> I remember something like that. Thou, it's about 4,000 miles an hour going around the sun. It's about four and a half, 450 miles an hour spinning. I don't know. But these things are going on all... While we sit here now, conscious, you are conscious, you've got a brain that uh, can understand and can explore and enjoy and worship if you choose, it's, and can e examine that universe. And you are here now, and if you don't believe in God, you have made a faith statement. You were just saying all of that, all of your existence is just however you choose to see it. And that is a faith statement. It's a, it's, you're believing something. Just like believing in God, believing in Christ is a faith statement. It's believing. It's not just... Th 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 so however you're living, you're making a faith statement. And I want to encourage you. We, as I said, we live in a world that throws different options at us. Come on, live like this. Put your faith in this way of living. Put sex... This is the, one of the main messages, isn't it? Put sex at the center of your universe and you will be happy. Right? That's a big one, isn't it? Put yourself, it's another big one, yourself at the center of your universe. Seeking fulfillment for yourself. Putting yourself first and then you'll be happy. 
The Christian faith is about putting Jesus, putting God at the center of our universe and seeking to serve him and finding fulfillment in not putting ourselves at the center, but putting him at the center. Seeking to know him and worship him and we're all in different places of encouragement and discouragement. And maybe at today you're here and you are struggling with your faith. And, and, and that's, we all go through seasons like that, particularly when things are difficult. And I want to encourage you all today. I want to encourage you. I want to, I want to try and strengthen you. God wants to strengthen you in your faith today. And I want, I want to say this to you. And I've... I mean, I, I mean, if they listen to this, forgive me, but I've, I've also come across a number of young people who have given up their faith or um, it, they're not likely to listen to this talk, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, a lot of some, some teenagers and young people who have given up their faith. And I'm saying this because I love them. I'm saying this because I love you. If you're a teenager in the room, you've got a lot of pressures on you, temptations on you. A lot of distractions as well. A lot of distractions to f that, that can take us away from Christ. And I want to say to you, if you're a teenager or any of you, if you are struggling with your faith, please do talk to a friend. Please feel free to talk to me. Please feel free to talk to someone. Because you need encouragement. And we love you. I love you. And I want to help you. And wherever you're at in your faith, I want to encourage you. But today's message really is we need to encourage each other. We need to be a community that loves each other enough not to be threatened when people struggle, not to get angry when people struggle, and to encourage each other genuinely when people struggle. That's what we need to be. And let me turn to Hebrews 10. 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And it goes on. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards loving good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So today I want us to reflect on this idea. Jesus has opened the way to the living God. So let's enter and encourage each other to keep entering God's empowering presence. Jesus has opened the way. This Christmas you may have gone to different relatives' homes. You may have been into different places where you've eaten nice food. You were invited maybe. If somebody showed up, you know, you had, you had to be invited maybe to those places. But you can all understand this idea of invitation. Being invited to a meal. Being invited to this special thing. You, if you're a Christian today, and if you're not a Christian today, you are invited into the presence of God. To live in his presence. And we need to keep encouraging us to keep living in his presence and entering his presence. Because that's where there is power, transformation, and encouragement. So Jesus has opened up the way to come into the presence of God. We have to, we, he says we have to have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ. God is a holy God. God is holy. That means he is without sin. And if that means nothing to you, it means he is perfect, he's pure, without fault. He's never thought, done anything that is wrong. 
He is pure and perfect. And whenever somebody meets with God in the, in the Bible, there's always a sense of, wow, I'm a sinner. I, I, I've, I've made so many thought mistakes in my thinking and my actions. I've done and haven't done things. I'm a sinner. I, I've so fallen short of God's standards. But he says here we can have confidence to enter the most holy place. We can enter God's presence. And the point he's making, he says, therefore, brothers and sisters. So in view of what, what's gone before, and that's about Jesus. Jesus has died for us. Jesus went to the cross for us. He took our sin upon himself so that we can enter confidently into the most holy place. And it's not just about prayer time. It's about all the time as well, living in the presence of God in our lives. Such a privilege, such a wonder. Jesus went to the cross for us. This is the very center of our faith. If I was to say, what do I want for you this year? Remember I said last, last week I'd love someone to buy me a nice car for Christmas. Remember I said that? You remember, were you here when I said that? And you laughed at me for saying it. Well, I like to say to you, I got a jacket. Didn't get a car. <laughs> but I like the jacket just as much, honestly. Um, why am I saying that? What would I most want for you this Christmas, this, this new year rather, is that you know Jesus and you know the grace he gives you, that you know his forgiveness and cleansing and that you live in the presence of God. That's what I most want for you. What do we most want for one another? I hope that's what we want for one another. What do we most want for our children if we've got them? We want them to know him, don't we? We want them to live with him in their lives. And that's what we want for our communities, isn't it? For them to come into God's presence, holy presence. They can't, end, they can't just enter God's holy presence. Let's not be fooled. They can't. We can't just live in God's holy presence. We can't just know God's holy presence. We've got to receive the cleansing that comes from Christ who died for us so that we can live and know and live eternally in God's holy presence. It says in Hebrews 10, this priest, when this priest... So, he's, so the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians and they understand a lot of this language that's being used. Most of us, I assume, in the room are not Jewish. So we may not understand a lot of the language and the symbolism that's used. But he uses this idea. But when this priest, now in Judaism and in many religions, right, they have priests. Remember, in Christianity, we're all priests, right? Let's just be very clear on that. You are all priests. You become priests of the living God. You can all pray. I want to make sure you understand that. That's a privilege you have. You can pray. David was saying to me earlier, prayer works. He, I mean, he came up and he gave thanks for the NHS because what he's saying was he'd experienced God's blessing and faithfulness through, through, through his own illness recently. And I hope that's, you don't mind me saying that, but you know, he's, he, he's saying prayer works. And um, what, that's part of the privileges of being a child of God. But he said, when this priest offered for all time, one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. And he says at the end of this, for by one sacrifice, how many? In the back, how many? One. <laughs> by one sacrifice, he is made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. One sacrifice. Remember when we take communion, that's not a sacrifice for sins. That is a remembrance of the one sacrifice of Christ. He offered himself. The old, in, see, in Judaism, they had priests and high priests. And we remembered at Christmas, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, if you remember, he went into the holy of holies, met God, well, met an angel of God. And that's what we're talking about. Jesus himself is our high priest, and he doesn't offer the blood of, of animals as they did in Judaism. 
which were symbolic of Christ's coming. No, Jesus offered himself. He is the, that's why we call him the Lamb of God. He has died for us. The one sacrifice. So how are you made holy? How are you cleansed? How can you have confidence to enter the most holy place? Because Jesus died once for you. He has made you perfect forever by one sacrifice. You have been made perfect forever. Isn't that good? Perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. So he adds in the idea of sanctification and growth. But I don't really want to talk, I want to talk, you've been made perfect forever in God's sight because of the one sacrifice of Christ. So however you messed up or however you feel, it's the one sacrifice of Christ that gives you confidence to enter the most holy place and live in the presence of God and have power to pray because Christ, the one sacrifice, that's what I want for you. That's what I want your confidence to be in. And if you're struggling in your faith, may the Holy Spirit bring you back to this, this central idea of Christ. Putting Jesus back at the center of our lives. Jesus has opened a way to enter the most holy place. In the, again, under Judaism, you had the temple that was destroyed in AD 72. AD 72, something like that. It was destroyed. And Jesus had predicted it would be destroyed. That era has come to an end where you had temple. This is not a temple. There are no temples. You are the temple now of the living God. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Having a, he says here, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. And again, he's referring back to Judah, uh, Jewish practices where the priests and high priests would be washed with pure water. And this is all symbolic. And you, it says here, your consciences need to be cleansed of a guilty conscience. How can you have your conscience cleansed? Again, look at Christ. Look at Jesus. He has died to take your sin and that sin that is on your conscience. Now confess it to him. Say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. But at that very moment, you are cleansed and your conscience is cleansed. Don't allow the accuser to keep accusing you of those past sins because you have been cleansed from them because they've been laid on Christ. Your high priest has taken them away. He says, let's draw near to God. So because Jesus has died for you, because you've been cleansed, let's draw near to God by faith. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Let's draw near. Let's, let's draw near to God. Let's be those who draw near to him to get on a, like when we meet on a Sunday morning. Let's draw near to God. Let's, let's, by faith, remember what we're doing when we come here. Let's remember that we are drawing near to God. When you pray in the mornings, in the afternoons, in the evenings, as you walk down the street, wherever you pray and whenever you pray, remember, you are drawing near to God. When you come together to a prayer meeting, when you get together with your community group, wherever, wherever setting you're in, with brothers and sisters or on your own, draw near to God. He's there to be drawn near to. When you're lonely, draw near to him. When you're tempted, draw near to him. When you're discouraged, draw near to him. He is near. He wants us to draw near. Let us draw near. He says here, with the full assurance that faith brings. Put your faith on Christ again. Draw near to Christ. He says in, the, um, in Ephesians, Paul says, take up the shield of faith 
with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, what are those arrows? You see, you get arrows flung at you all the time, don't you? You are useless. You've sinned too much. You've failed too much. Jesus isn't real. God isn't real. This is the way to real life, etc. Fiery arrows flung at us. Lift up the shield of faith. Say, no, I am a son of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm going to believe on Christ. Keep putting your faith in him. Keep drawing near. Let us draw near to God. And the author to the Hebrews talks about this new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. Now, again, that's referring to Jewish practices. And the idea that within the temple you had different sections and right at the center was the Holy of Holies. And this was within it, which was the ark. Remember that they carried the ark or Raiders of the Lost Ark. You might know about the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's not real. This is real. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, the ark was in the center and that spoke of God's presence. But it was separated from the people by the curtain. And the high priest could enter that place, the holy place, holy of holies, once a year on the day of atonement. The idea God is so holy. Only one man can enter on one day a year. That's the idea. But now, it says here, this curtain. And on the day that Jesus died, when he gave up his spirit, Matthew tells us that the curtain was torn in half from top to bottom. God himself parted and destroyed the curtain. Opening the way. Through the blood of Jesus, through the death of Christ, you can enter the most holy place. Every single one of us through Jesus Christ. The way has been opened, so let's draw near to God. His one sacrifice has made you perfect forever. Let's draw near to him. Let's use that privilege to pray Let's use that privilege to worship with him. And I'm speaking to myself now. I get distracted all the time. It's a privilege of preaching, isn't it? Is that you get a chance to remind yourself of these important things. I encourage you, friends. Draw near to God. And let me just finish with, by reminding you of a few things here. In Hebrews chapter 12, again, we're in the same book, Hebrews chapter 12. It says here, but you have, so think about what does it mean when we come to church or when we draw near to God, what, what does that mean? What does it, what does it, what does it mean? It says here, but you, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the, right, of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. So wh when we come together, when we draw near to God, I want we to have a few things in mind. We have come to the city of the living God. You, know, you thought you were coming to Werter Road this morning, didn't you? You thought you were coming to this, this, this you know, humble, relatively humble building. No, you've come to the city of the living God. And so is every other Christian on the earth. You've come to the city of the living God. You walked through the, the gates of heaven this morning. When you meet with your brothers and sisters, you are in the heaven. You are in a heavenly place because God's presence is here. You are in the city of the living God. What Jerusalem used to represent symbolically now is being experienced by us. The city of the living God is us. Wow. I hope we have that attitude when we go to community group. As you walk into that front room, sit down to have your coffee. Come to the city of the living God. It says, it says here to 
Thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. That's what you've come to. When Zechariah met Gabriel in the holy place at that Christmas story, that's happening to you every time you pray, every time you worship. You've come to angels in joyful assembly. There's so much going on, more than you can see, isn't there? The heavenlies is here. Joined with angels. It says here, and to saints who have been made perfect. And that's why I don't believe in soul sleep. I don't believe that when you die, you go to sleep until the resurrection. It says here, you've joined with spirits of righteous, spirits of righteous people made perfect. So you are worshipping not here. Now, I appreciate that. I don't believe that there are, there are the presence of dead Christians with us here. But you are, they are in heaven worshipping whilst we are here worshipping. And in a funny sort of way, we have entered heaven and are worshipping with them. I leave you to work that out. It's very mysterious. But it says here, doesn't it? You've come to God and to spirits of the righteous made perfect. I don't believe you can communicate with them, but I don't know what, I don't know. But you are worshipping with saints in heaven when you worship. That's amazing to know, isn't it? And to Jesus. You, Jesus, is, Jesus is with us when we pray, when we meet, when we worship, as we walk down the street. Jesus is with us. His loving presence is with us. The band's going to come up. We're going to worship now. It says, let us draw near to God. Friends, today and this new year, make it, if you've got a resolution at all, make it this. I'm going to draw near to God through Christ, and I'm going to encourage others to do the same. Yeah? If you've got an ambition this year, I'm going to draw near to God through Jesus, and I'm going to encourage others to do the same. We will meet people who are discouraged. We will meet people who are losing their faith. We will meet people in different circumstances and God wants to use you. Someone who's filled with his presence, somebody who meets with him to encourage others in their own relationship with Jesus. So stand together. Jesus has opened the way come to the living God. To the living God. He's opened the way, opened the gates to the city of God for you. He's opened the, there's a welcome for you, friends. You walk through those gates, there's angels in joyful assembly. He says we're meeting with, somehow worshipping also with saints who have been made perfect, who have gone ahead of us. That's what we're doing when we worship. We're meeting with Christ. We're meeting with the living God. That's why we can expect miracles. That's why we can expect encouragement. And that's why we can expect spiritual opposition to discourage you from being involved and meeting together with your brothers and sisters. So let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let's encourage one another. Let's come together. Let's keep encouraging each other to meet with the living God through Christ. Let's do that now, shall we? Let's worship him now together.